lecture two okay, of uh, CFT in two dimensions. So let me just remind you a bit what we did uh, last time. Okay, so we wanted to explore these things called conformal transformations. Which were transformations that we paid G metric into something. Well, let's go to eta, I'm going to be in flat space. It's eta to some uh, so, uh, eta times some positive function, right? So, in this here, we found that the conditions that these changes, these maps should obey, can be determined from a thing called the conformal healing equation, okay, which was this very nice equation that said, these are the, so we have maps, this one, and we found that this function has to obey the decimetric, decimetric part is equal to 2 over d epsilon eta mu. Okay? Then in the tutorial we explored, I mean, we found a bunch of consequences of this, and in the tutorial we did the explicit things. Okay? We played with the calculations, we sort of played some tricks, and found some very nice conditions, and we arrived to the conclusion that the conformal loop or the algebra to be more precise, well, corresponds to SO D minus 1, 2. Even though I think I said that it was D minus 1, I don't think I changed it in the black one. So go back to your notes and please put the minus 1 and minus 1. Okay? I'm not sure where I did. Uh, so we found this, and we found that it has some generators. So can somebody tell me all the generators? So we have D that was generating what? Scalings or dilatations. What else? Sorry, what? M I call it L. That's the name I used. So that's okay. So this is uh, boosts and rotations, right? What else? mu that generated translation. And what else? The crazy guy, right? Special and conformal transformations. Okay? So we found that this algebra, if you organize it in a smart way, which was the homework, you organize it in a smart way, you can show that it basically corresponds to the transformations that preserve a metric in one dimension more, okay, with one extra minus. Okay. That's, that was the point. Now, we finish with the fact that in two dimensions something special happens, right? So I, what we did is that we wrote the conformal killing equations explicitly, okay? Remember that, okay, warning, we're in Euclidean now. And I make more of the, the lecture more entertaining with colors. So, um, so we, so we found that in two dimensions it has this very nice form that where was given by d zero epsilon one equals to two equals to d one epsilon zero and then we have sorry sorry this is uh, zero zero one one right and then we have d zero epsilon one equals to minus d one epsilon zero. Okay? This is just by writing these guys out explicitly. And I told you that this corresponded to a set of very famous equations called the conform, the, sorry, called the cauchy riemann equation. And can somebody tell me what these cauchy riemann equations tell us? Do you remember what they mean? Yes. They are very important, very, very famous. It's, it means that the Laplace ensemble is completely, infinitely deliverable in the complex. Yeah, I mean, there is a, there is a shorthand to say. It's holomorphic. holomorphic, right? Yeah, it's analytic, okay, all over the complex. So, basically, but I haven't complexified anything, right? So, what we are going to do is to complexify it. And what we do is that we are going to 
find these coordinates, z to be equal to, equal to plus x1. Okay? Zero plus x1. Okay? And if you play a bit with this, I mean, these are simple games to play, but it's going to be part of your tutorial, because you, you can define a derivative to dc, derivative to dc bar, and so on. Okay? And in the tutorial, we will show that this equation okay, is equivalent to saying that dc bar epsilon equals to zero. That's what homomorphic means. It means that it depends only on c and not on c bar. Okay, so this is something we're going to show. It's very straightforward. Okay, but now these are really, really great news. Okay, because complex analysis has, I mean, during the big part of the 19th century and also big part of the 20th century, a huge amount of technology was developed for this uh, for this homomorphic system. Okay. We were very fortunate that mathematicians did their hard work already, and now we can do a lot of calculations very easily. Okay? And um, so, what is the magical step of all these two-dimensional conformal fields? So now I can, I know that my transformations are homomorphic, okay? And somehow I should be able to rewrite these guys in, some term, in terms of some maps in complex coordinates. But the really magic step here, it's something that, that was, uh, I think it was discovered by this guy, by basically everything I'm explaining here, it's already in that paper. Bellerin, uh, Olyakov, and uh, this is hard. I think it's like that. Some logical, is correct. Uh, Bellerin, Polyakov, and Salomonological, they realized that actually, the group of transformations in two dimensions can be enhanced to an infinite dimensional. Okay, so why is this great news? So here we have something that has a, we're always striving to have more and more symmetry, right? Because more and more symmetry constraints, more and more the kind of things that can happen. Okay? So all of a sudden you realize that you have an infinite dimensional group. I mean, this is a, it's a huge symmetry group. And this huge symmetry group will constrain the system so much that sometimes you can even solve the full theory. This is a remarkable thing. I mean, managing to solve a full quantum field theory is very difficult. Sometimes you can do it in these two-dimensional conformal field theories. Okay? So, what's the trick? How, how did you end up with an infinite dimensional group? So, remember, we're, now we're doing a transformation like this, right? So, we're transforming z to z plus epsilon z. Okay? With this guy, is holomorphic. Okay? So the key step here is that we take holomorphic and enhance it to something called meromorphic. I will explain you what is this. So, so meromorphic is a function that is holomorphic in an open set of the complex plane. That means that it's going to have poles. We're going to allow the function to have poles. Does, does everybody know what poles are in a complex function? Okay, divergences. We have divergences. We are allowed to have divergences at isolated points. So that means that this function over here, what's the, what's the defining characteristic of, an, of a meromorphic function? Come on, guys. You, you know all this. Okay, it's that they have something called a Lorentz expansion. Okay? So it means that I can write it. So it was, as you were saying, they have to be, you have to be able to expand it in a power series. That, that's an analytic function. So the meromorphic ones are functions in which I allow, let me put the minus here, it's important, and the n plus one. Are functions in which I allow for things like 1 or z, 1 or z squared, and so on. Okay? These are divergent things at C. Okay? So now you can see that, quite likely, I will, now I have an to each of these guys, I should be able to associate the genitive. Okay, so we'll have an infinite dimensional group. Let me write it and then it's going to be more clear. So let's see. Uh, the generators associated with these are going to be and of course I have a I'm not writing it here, but I also have an anti- an anti chiral part. Okay, I have the DC like this, and I also can do transformations like this, right? You can always take the conjugate, right? So, so 
the other generator is going to be. Okay, if anybody has a doubt as to how to get these generators, the trick is very simple. So you take a field, okay, and now you write it instead of phi of z, you write it at phi of z tilde, the transformer. And then you expand in power series. And then what you will find is that these guys are going to be hitting the phi. It's just basically like doing a Taylor series, a bit fancy. Okay? And that's how you identify that these are the Okay? So, sorry. Right. I think I, I got lost the, the, from. We said uh, epsilon is homomorphic. Uh, you can also do an anti homomorphic. Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, from that side easy. to the mm -hmm. to the transformation from homomorphic to meromorphic, I think I didn't. So so it's because that's the genius that of this guys. So <laughs> yeah, that's so basically they realize that okay you can I mean these are transformations that work in all the complex plane right the holomorphic transformation. But then they realize that you can have an isolated set of points, and you can still transform everything. And it's okay. It's a symmetry that will be constraining enough. So that's, those ones are called metamorphic functions. That's the enhancement. Okay? They decided that, okay, there are going to be transformations that are going to work everywhere, and there are transformations that will work everywhere but the finite set of points. Okay? That's the step. But okay. that's the trick. That still works. Sorry? I'm saying, but that still works if it goes. As of course it works. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. And the poles are going to be the most important part. Okay? You guys, I mean, the ones that have done quantum field theory, you know that the important things are the poles, right? I mean, poles are really, really important things. Okay? So, these are going to be the generators of this thing. And now they form an algebra. Okay? And this algebra has the name of someone. Okay? So, you know, these are important. This is called the bit algebra. Okay? And this is another thing that you will have to verify by yourself. These are very simple problems, the ones I'm giving you will see. But this bit algebra says that the commutator here, ln ln, equals m minus n ln plus n. Okay? Not yet Virasoro. I haven't gotten to Virasoro. Okay? So this is the Vitagora, which is almost Virasoro, which is the, it's going to be our main character in this lecture. Okay? So how do you try? You will have to show this in the tutorial, but all you do is that you put a test function, and then you hit with these derivatives, and you will see that it's super easy. Okay? That m and n will come from when the derivative hits these z's. Okay? So it's not a big deal. Now, the Vitagora, now, let's just do one little thing, so a little step here, important. We're going to take the complex plane and add a point at infinity. Okay, you're probably all, of, all used to this thing. And this is going to give us the Riemann sphere, okay? So we're just going to, you all know this thing, right? I mean, you can take the complex plane and add a point at infinity, and this gives you a sphere, okay? Now, this sphere, so first question from the advanced students. Why is it okay to now work in the sphere all of a sudden? I was in the plane, now I say, yeah, let's go to the sphere. No, 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 that has nothing to do with topology. Isomorphism, it's a... It's a mapping. Yeah, but there's a mapping of which map? Which so one to one. More than that? You're the, all the things you're saying are true. Yeah, yeah. Huh? Is that a stereographic projection? Sorry? Is that a stereographic project? It's a stereographic projection, that is true. But so? It's homomorphic. So it's conformal. Okay, that's, I mean, we've been saying conformal, conformal all the time, and uh, this is the first conformal map that you ever learned, right? The, because it preserves angles, right? So there is this. Uh, well. Uh, yeah, something like that. Right? <laughs> That's the worst representation of the stereographic projection in history, but you know what I mean. Okay? So it's because it's conformal. So it means since I'm working with the theories that are invariant on the conformal transformation, it's okay if I go to this plane, right? Because for the theory, nothing happened. Apparently. Okay? Right. So now let me just single out some important generators in this big output. Okay, and these generators are L, L, L minus 1, sorry, L minus 1. 
L0 and L plus 1. Okay? These guys there are the ones that generate the conformal algebra. Okay? Generate the, conform the usual conformal algebra, the one that we were studying before. So I've not a lot. So if you come here and you plug a 0, this is okay, right? This is not, there has no 1 over thingies. Okay? If you plug a 1, so also z squared, you plug a minus 1, it's also alright. Okay? So now this algebra, many, well, I will refer to it as the global conformal algebra. And it will be your task also in the tutorial, which is again, I'm giving you very simple exercises, to show to, to explain what these different things generate. Okay? So notice that L minus 1 equals to it's just dz, right? Right? It's just minus dz. Minus dz. What is L0? Minus dz. And L1? Minus z squared, right? Right? Now, this one, you will, you will show and it's super easy. This generates complex translation, right? Now, remember that in our complex plane, we have x0 is time, x1 is space. So this generates, somehow it gener generates, uh, what do you call it, time translation. This one, what does it do? What, what does it do? It's scaling, right? This is the one generating scaling. And now, so, yeah, these rotations are inside. Here. And uh, complex scalings and rotations, sorry. Yeah, scalings and rotations. And the last guy generates special conformal transformation. Okay. So this is the center, this is the algebra, the familiar algebra. But now it's enhanced to this huge infinite dimensional algebra. Okay? So this is the one that works globally. Alright? And then the other part that you have to show is that all the possible transformations that you can generate with that correspond to something called Mobius transformations. Okay? Well, in the tutorial we will see these things in detail. These Mobius transformations. are transformations that take z and map it into az plus b over z plus b with ad minus bc equals to 1. Okay. It's a particular kind of transformation. And we will show we will show how this guy gives you these guys. Okay? And this is the conformal algebra, no, no. So now let's go to Virasoro. There is this famous Virasoro algebra. People have studied conformal field theory in 2D know that the key point is to study the Virasoro algebra. So the Virasoro algebra is nothing but something called a central extension. Central extension of that bit algebra. Of, of that bit algebra. It's called Virasoro algebra. So a central extension basically means that you can take the algebra and add some extra generators, so I give you the algebra of this, and you do a direct sum with the complex, with the complex. So you add some other complex guy that will commute with everybody. Now, it looks like an exercise in futility to do that thing, but it's really important. That extension will turn out to be like the, the soul of conformal field theory. Okay? So it's going to be something called the central charge, which has many different meanings. I mean, it counts degrees of freedom of a field theory, it measures Casimir energies. It tells you a lot of interesting stuff. Okay? So let me explain you how this is done. So basically what you do is that you take your algebra, your usual algebra, and add an extra part. So you take these commutators here. Let me call it LM, LM. Okay? Capital guys. Okay? And the first part is just bit algebra. M minus N. Lm plus n. And then I add to this algebra an extra term. 
Okay, and this extra term, for now, I'm going to call it P, let me put it in order, M, M, N. It's a function of M, and N. Okay? And whatever this guy is, this guy commutes with everything. It's just a complex number. We'll just do this extension. Okay? Now, our job is to find out what P is. Okay? So, what is P? This is a very nice exercise, okay? It's also an exercise for you. Very nice exercise. And I will take you all the hints you need to find it, okay? So all of these will follow from something called the Jacobi identity. Does everybody know what the Jacobi identity is? Okay, so this will follow from the Jacobi identity, and the Jacobi identity will tell us that this algebra equals, and this is going to be the famous algebra in this story, and this is C over 12, and I'm sorry, minus 1, uh, delta m plus n. Alright? So that means, notice that there are contributions only if these things are, uh, only if this thing, if m equals n, right? m minus n, right? That's what this means. Put a comma 0, so that now, one thing to notice of this Virasoro algebra is that for our this global conformal algebra, this contribution isn't there, right? Can, can everybody see that? So that means that the conformal group, the global conformal group, we're not even touching it. Okay? So this is called the Virasoro algebra. And this thing is called, called the central charge. Okay. So this one is very important. It's a very important one. Okay. Is it more or less clear? I mean, it doesn't have to be totally clear, but more or less clear. So let's just make a little rephrasing of everything that went up. So we want the things that preserve angles. We found an equation that determines transformations that preserve angles. We saw that in two dimensions that was Cauchy-Riemann. Then we needed that meant that it was holomorphic transformations, right? Now, we realize that holomorphic transformations, if we're willing to give up some isolated points, can be promoted or demoted, depends on you, to metamorphic transformations. And those ones are actually an infinite dimensional set. Inside that infinite dimensional set, we have the generators that give you the global ones, okay? And all the, the algebra of these guys, all the algebra of these metamorphic transformations, gives you something that looks like this, okay? Then we realized that we could add, there is something extra, probably, in this algebra, and it's given by this central expansion. This looks a bit ad hoc. But okay, it could be zero, right? It could be that C is zero. Okay, so let's just add it for now. And then let's see if C plays a role. If C turns out to be irrelevant, okay, please scratch. Okay? Right, so now let's talk about fields. Keep talking about fields here, I haven't said anything about fields. Okay, just talking about algebras. So let's talk about fields. So fields, as you all know, are, I mean, I'm just going to talk about scalars, this thing, mm -hmm. nothing fancy, just simple scalars. And I'm going to focus on two kinds of fields. Two kinds of fields that are going to be very important. Some fields called chiral fields, and some fields called primary fields. These are going to be the most important modular one other guy. Okay, it's going to be very important. Now, notice that fields now, they, were, they used to be functions of space and time, which meant x0 is 1, and now I'm going to write them as functions of z and z bar. Okay? They can depend on both things. A field is said to be chiral if phi equals phi, meaning just homomorphic. So chiral is going to be homomorphic, okay? Anti-chiral is going to mean anti-homomorphic. So no means so anti means that this thing is the same equals phi and z bar. Yeah. First kind, first kind. Now primary fields, so you know, it's primary and something called quasi. So this tells us information about 
how fields transform on their scale. Okay? So imagine that now you take your space time and you rescale it with some lambda. Okay? So a field that transforms in the following way, it's going to be called a primary or a quasi-primary. It's a field that transforms like phi z z bar goes to, and um, always have to be careful here. So yeah, goes to lambda h lambda h bar phi lambda z lambda z bar. So I'm doing a rescaling by some lambda, okay? And this behaves in such a way that this scale sort of comes out in this nice way. Okay? Not every field is going to be like that. Okay? These are going to be very nice fields. These so are going to be fields that, I mean, you've been talking to Robert about primaries. These guys are going to be the primaries of the representations of this algebra. Okay? They're going to be very important. Okay? Highest weight states of that. Now, if this is true, this is true for a field, for the global conformal group, only, okay, important, we call it a quasi-primary. Okay? If this is true for the full conformal group, okay, if any conformal transformation, well, maybe this is not the right way. Sorry, sorry, sorry. This is just, sorry, sorry. Let me, let me backtrack. Let me leave it again. So this is going to be the primary or quasi primary. Let me generalize the map. Now let me map, do the following map. Let's map set to f of set. Sorry. Need a more general transformation, right? I mean, this is just a scale. So let's say that I consider a more general transformation. F go, set goes to f of set, so more transformation. And now I want the field to transform like this. Phi prime, this is not a derivative, it's just the prime. going to transform like uh, bf bz bf bar bz bar okay. z okay so this reduces to this one for scales, right? So if a field transforms in this nice way, so notice that when it's happening, I'm, I'm acting, I'm taking the space of Z, I'm applying an F, and I'm telling you, look, the field now will be, the field times this very nice Jacobian. When this Jacobian actually has some uh, weight, some weight. Now these guys have a name, and they are called the conformal weights. This is not necessary, this is not the conjugate of this. This is always a very confusing thing in this CAT. It's just another, it's just another image. Informal weights. Now, as I told you, this is not going to be true for every field. There's going to be a special kind of field, and the fields for which this is true for the full Vida Solo algebra, for any metamorphic F, are going to be called primary. Okay, so full Vida Sora. It's called primary. Just global. It's going to be called uh, quasi primary. So notice that every primary is a quasi primary, but not vice versa, right? Okay. Now it will will not be totally clear why why I'm making these definitions, but if you keep going with your study of conformal field theory, which I actually think you should, uh, you will see that they are super super important. Okay, they are the simplest kind. So it's always good to start with the simplest kind. All right. So let's see what we're doing. So now let's study how primary fields transform, okay? On their conformal transformation, infinitesimal. So, how does, how do we figure out how a primary field transforms on the uh, infinitesimal, on the infinitesimal conformal transformation? So let's 
say x mu goes to x mu plus epsilon x. How would you do that if I give you the exercise in an exam? Now, show me how a, a primary field transforms under this kind of What do you do? I mean, this is, these are tricks that we should all know by now, and it's because they are super easy, right? You just plug this thing in here, right? Expand. And we plug it also here. And we do a Taylor expansion, well, a long expansion. Okay? Is it clear for everybody how this works? So we just substitute this instead of f and expand to order epsilon, all right? If you do that, which I hope you try to do in a moment, you will find that it transforms in a very, in a very simple way. It transforms like a phi zz. Keep in mind that this is true only for primary fields. This is not true for everything. It goes to uh, phi zz bar. Okay, and the change is H is like epsilon plus H, sorry, plus, sorry, plus epsilon is that. And let me put the phi here. Plus the anti chiral part. Okay? Every time I will have the same copy of this with bars all over the place. So a bar here, a bar here, a bar here, and like that. Okay. Now, let's see where the, the different contributions come from. I just want to make sure that you understand. This contribution comes from, this is a question for, comes from this part or from this part? So you develop an eye. So you don't have to do everything on your own. The second one, right? Because it has a derivative heating. You see, that's how you figure it out. It came from expanding this, like from Taylor expanding, and you have a chain rule. The chain rule forces you to take a derivative. Okay? And obviously the other guy. Okay. So this is going to be an important. It looks like a silly equation, but it's going to be very important. So we're going to give it a name. We're going to call it asterisk one. Okay? In case we may ever get to use it. Alright, so up to now we found these fields with the co-primaries, they transform very nicely. This is how they transform into the test. So don't get fooled by thinking that all the fields are primaries. Okay? It's very important. In fact, probably the most important field of all, it's not a primary. Okay? And this field is called the, uh, well, it's an the phase, called the energy <coughs> momentum tensor. I guess all of you have heard about this. Okay? Very famous. So the energy momentum tensor. It's one of the fields that are going to be here, right? Now, the, can anybody tell me what is the energy momentum tensor? What, what does it mean, the energy momentum tensor? A couple of different ways. The Lagrangian. Sorry? Is the Lagrangian? Yeah. Oh, another thing. He said the word Lagrangian. We haven't even shown any Lagrangian in the world. Okay? This is actually quite an interesting. We, we're getting very far without. Setting a Lagrangian. But let's say that I have a Lagrangian, so a hypothetical Lagrangian, or an action. What is the energy moment to this? Charge. Charge. More or less, there's going to be a charge associated with it. So the energy momentum tensor, it's very important, is the response that the action would have under a change of metric. Okay? If you were to sort of take space, even if you're in flat space, I give you a theory in flat space. <coughs> And I tell you, look, couple it to some fiduciary metric, some metric that it's not that it's a dynamical metric. Okay? And now you take a, a variation with respect to that metric, that's the energy momentum tensor. Okay? Tells you how the theory responds to space, to change in space. Okay? So it's very, very important that. And the energy momentum tensor will capture all the information we need for studying conformal fields. Meaning you don't need to know the explicit form of the Lagrangian. But sometimes it's useful. You don't need to know it in general. You just need to know the properties of the energy momentum tensor. Okay? So let me just write very briefly what I said. Yeah. So the energy momentum tensor can be found. It's basically the answer to what happens under taking some g mu mu to okay. 
And it's very important, you know it from Einstein's equation, probably, right? It's the right hand side in Einstein's equation. And you see, that's precisely what you do, right? I mean, the ones that have the NGR. You take a variation with respect to the metric. And the part of the energy momentum tensor is precisely when it hits all the other things that are not right side. Okay? Alright, so now uh, let's see <coughs> what do we know about this thing? But what's the importance of this? And as you know, I was saying, this is related to charges, right? I mean, it's related to conserved charges, right? So you remember that there is this very big theory of light, Neuter, his name I can here by Neuter, which tells you, can anybody tell me what the Neuter term says? Celeste. For any? For any continuous symmetry, there is a conservation one. It's a very profound thing, right? For any continuous. Continuous symmetry. There is some conserved. Let's put some conserved quantity. So, for example, you know that for transformation, for if you have translational variance, what is conserved? Linear momentum. If I have rotational invariance, and so on, right? So you have these symmetries, and then you can identify something conserved. Okay. Now, in this case, we have we want to study what happens under conformal symmetries, right? So there is going to be some conserved quantity. This conserved. Let's first start with the current, okay? And the current is going to be given by. Let me see if I write it right. Yeah, maybe let's put the index down. Sorry. Uh, it's going to be T mu nu epsilon nu. So this is going to be the generator of the transformation, okay? And this tensor is going to be symmetric. And this is the energy momentum tensor, okay? Now what we're going to try to find is if epsilon, if not any epsilon, but the epsilon associated with conformal transformations, does this tell us, some, tells us something about T or not? I mean, does it constrain T? Something happens with T or not? So let's start first with the first trivial part, and is that that quantity has to be conserved, right? Okay, well, has to be should have a T mu, J mu, has to be. Uh, let me put that is, has to be equal to zero, right? For any epsilon, right? In particular, if epsilon is a constant. This is, a, this is a one of the possible epsilon, right? If epsilon is a constant, what we, what we will conclude about this? What's the conclusion? Who's conserved? The full T, right? So full T is conserved. So this is the first thing we found, which is another easy one, is this conservation law. Notice that here we didn't use any conformal symmetry. Right? I mean, this is just, it just happens. Just follow from this equation. It's basically by definition. Okay? But now let's make it interesting. Now let's promote epsilon to a function. Okay? Let's pick a non trivial epsilon. But not any function. We want a function that generates, let me put it in the conformal, in the conformal algebra, maybe. Conformal algebra. Okay? Let's take an epsilon that generates. Or a conformal transformation. Okay? So let's write this out. Let's write this thing out. So let's see. This is, uh, this is very nice. Use. So let's keep this one in here. So we're going to have two terms, right? We're going to have the first term where the D gets hung up here. Okay? We have D mu. D mu mu. Uh, epsilon nu, right? And then we have the second term where the D gets hung up in uh, the of the cloud. Hung up here. Everybody understands this, right? Right. So what happens with the first term? It's zero, right? We know that it's zero, so it's zero. And now, what can we do with the next term? It's actually very cute. What can we do with this term? We can... We can 
symmetry. You have to speak louder because this is the right answer. Because t mu is symmetric, uh -huh. and then you can divide by two and four. This has to be equal to zero, remember, right? Yeah. This is equal to zero. So t mu is symmetric, right? So that means that I can write this as what? Let me just put it like this, t mu nu. And then I can write epsilon nu plus nu epsilon nu, right? And then have to pay with one uh half, -huh, right? Sure. It's clear for everyone? Yeah. I'm just a little uh, confused why you're using the conservation of the momentum t which is a condition when epsilon is constant. Because it has to be true, I mean, this has to be true for every epsilon. In particular, for a constant epsilon. So this is true in general. This becomes true in general, okay? Because, because of the forever, at the beginning of epsilon, before epsilon, for every epsilon. So now I can use it from now on, okay? Now I have a function. Now I, have, I'm, I got myself into trouble. So t mu nu is it's symmetric, right? And now I find this thing. So anybody but you. Have you seen this before? Yeah. It's a conformal Keeling equation, right? So what we find is that this is equal to 1 half t mu nu. And they're going to be constant, but they're not going to be important. Let's write it. It's going to be 2 over b, b epsilon, eta, mu nu, right? And this is a very cool result. This, all these constants, I mean, this is true for every epsilon, in particular epsilon, that this thing is non-zero, otherwise it's, it's very boring. That means that t, now, this contracts with this, and this means that t mu nu is equal to zero. And this is the hallmark of uh, conformal field theories. Conformal field theories are theories with the stress energy tensor is, has no stress energy. Okay? So if I give you a Lagrangian and you want to check if your theory is conformal, the first test that you should do is take the Lagrangian, couple it to a fiduciary metric. Okay? That means whatever you find an eta, put some g. Take the variation with respect to that g and you will find that tensor. Take the trace of that tensor. If it's zero, ah, it might be that you are there. Okay? We notice that we proved one direction of the application. If this is non-zero, okay, no, then conform, there is no conformal Okay, so this is a very important thing. Now, one little comment. Imagine that we weren't working with uh, conformal field theories, but just Lorentz environment field theories. Remember that the conformal killing equation, this thing was equal to zero, right? I don't know if you remember that. If you remember, this would be equal to zero. So you get zero equals to zero. So you don't get any extra condition. Okay? So it's very important that this term is there in order to get a new condition. Okay? Let me write here for CFDs. Notice that I didn't say it's not in 2D, right? This is, this is true in general. Okay? Let me put the CFD B. Yeah. Now let's go to two dimensions and let's see what this means. Okay? particular case of two dimensions. Is it clear that I mean at least these steps? This is very important that you understand. Okay, the Virasoro algebra thing is a bit more fancy and complicated, but this is important, it's basic things that are important. So now let's go back to 2D and let's see how this guy and that guy over there look into D. Okay? So for that you have to do this change of coordinates. Okay? But you have to transform the tensor, right? You know that you know that tensors don't transform trivially, right? I mean, you cannot just plug the coordinates and then uh, evaluate it. So you have to do something like this that I really invite you to do because it's, it's easy. Okay? So let's say that in these ones, I'm using the ZZ bar coordinates and here I'm using, sorry, bar, and here I'm using X0, X1. So you want to go from this, from the tensor that is the one we're studying, right? Here, you want to go from this one to this one, okay? For that, what you have to use, please do, do this on your own, okay? This is, I mean, x0 is the real part, okay? And x1 is the imaginary part, right? Right. 
So if you do that, then you can take you can find these ones, right? You take the zero d let's say d of dx zero dz. So basically just taking the derivative. And that will give you the components of t in z z bar. Is it clear more or less how to proceed this to do this in your own? Your own? Okay. So I will just write them. Please please check it. Check that you get this new one. So what you find is that T Z and this start with the diameters. One over four of T zero zero minus two R T one zero minus T one one. Okay? Then you have T Z bar Z bar, that'll be one quarter, T zero zero, plus two I T one zero uh, minus T one one. Okay. Did you notice that these are x, the x0, x0 component, x1, x0 component, etc. Okay? And then the cross terms, they're going to be equal. And they are going to be equal to 1 quarter t0, 0, t1, 1, 1. So we find immediately there is a thing you can say about this. About the stress tensor. About the make how the matrix, so this is the matrix of the stress tensor. Right? Let's say that here you have C, C, C bar, C bar. Can you say something about these components? Really, really fast. Huh? They are equal, that's true, that's true. It's symmetric. What else? They are equal to T00 plus T11. And we are in, in Euclidean signature, so that should be done. Zero. It's zero, why? It's because of the stress energy. Because it's stressless, okay? So, it's the first result we find, okay? So for conformal field theories, I mean, we could have done this change of coordinates for theories that are non-conformal, right? Okay. But when they are conformal, the off-diagonal terms are zero. Because that's the first conclusion that we get, right? Now, we can use this fact also to write T11 as minus T00, T00, right? So we will rewrite this thing a bit. Did everybody understood that? Uh, that's that? Okay, now that means that we can write TZZ as 1 over 2 uh, T, let's keep the 0, 0. T00 zero zero minus I T10 TCC equals to 1 half T00 zero zero plus I T10. Okay. Now, the last step. We used already traces. Okay. What else do we know about energy momentum tensors? I box two equations, right? Mm -hmm. I raised one. So we know that they are traces and we know that they are conserved, right? So that means that we have this extra equation to implement. Okay? So now we have to write that equation in complex coordinates, which is not a hard thing to do. So you have to do the change of coordinates carefully. I also want you to do it. And you will find that this implies in complex coordinates that this z E C bar C bar. Okay? Equals. Notice that this is a vector equation, right? It's a vector equation. So this equals to zero. And E C bar equals zero. Now let's just focus on this one for a second. What is this telling us about T C C? It's a holomorphic function. This is a huge result. Okay? So we just realized that the stress tensor, when you have a conformal field theory and you go to the complex plane, you realize that it actually takes its natural structure, which is one anti-holomorphic part and one holomorphic part. So this is the key point. It separates. Conformal group separates into a chiral part, that's why we talk about chiral and anti-chiral, into a chiral part and an anti-chiral part. Okay? This is what's important. I don't give it a number, but just give a definition. That means that the stress tensor hereafter 
we will express it like this, we just, because we don't want to be putting these Z's and this stuff. It's just notation. We're going to say that DCC equals, I'm going to write it like this, so I just write it TZ. What I mean is that component, okay, which is this component here. Here I have a zero, right? Here I have a zero. And the other one I'm going to call it DZ, in bar C bar. Are we clear until now? So now we have the stress energy tensor, which is going to be the guy that's going to tell us all the information. All the information about conformal transformations is hidden in this guy. Okay? Everything is hidden there. Okay? So you can get, without defining anything, you can get very far just using this guy. So now let's try to see what happens with field teams. Let's start to go. What, how much time do we have? Two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> okay. Maybe this okay, is slide, so maybe. maybe I just motivate the thing very fast and then we really do it next. I think we might even manage to finish my program. <laughs> I mean, at least uh, a bit. Okay, so let me just tell you what we're going to do now. What we're going to do is that we're going to try to quantize a theory. We're going to perform a theory. We're going to try to play it. But the game we're going to play is something called radial quantization. I'm not going to do the full thing because there are lots of subtleties. I mean, there are different ways to do it. But I will try to explain to you tomorrow what the main ideas are of this way. So the idea is that we're going to take our field theory and we're going to define it on a cylinder like this. We're going to have a cylinder where time goes in this direction. We're taking space to be compact like this. Okay? Space. Of course, for a Minkowski theory, this, there is an actual separation there. For uh, an Euclidean, we have to, it's kind of arbitrary that we can do it. Okay? We're going to put x0 here and x1 there. Now, what we're going to do is that we're going to map that cylinder to the plane in such a way that we're going to put here time equals to minus infinity at the center, and all the equal time surfaces or lines, are going to be concentric circles, okay? Let me put them up one. So time at infinity is going to be here, right? So if you were in a Riemann sphere, you have the point at infinity, you will have infinite past on the south pole, infinite future in the north pole, right? And the time evolution would be in the moving like this. So we map it to the plane because here in the plane we're going to be using our complex analysis. And now the why do we do this crazy thing is that something really nice happens. Remember, we define the stress energy tensor in terms of a current, right? But what we want to extract from currents are charges, because charges are the guys that generate symmetry, right? You remember that. So what we want to extract is the charge, and to extract the charge, I don't know if you remember what you used to do in your classical mechanics course, or if you you took a constant time slice, right? You fix time, and then you integrate over space. Isn't that what you do? You remember that? So I give you the current. You say time equals to 20 seconds. Now you take and integrate over all space, and that thing is the charge. All right. Now an integral of that kind. How does it look here? So here it looks like <coughs> I fixed some height, right? In this time, okay. Fixed some time here, and now I integrated over this circle. Is it clear? Everybody's following? Now, how does that look in here? It looks like I'm integrating over a concentric circle. Right? That's going to be the way I will generate charges. Now, what is the amazing thing of integrating around circles in a, in a complex plane is that we can use a Cauchy theorem. We can deform the contours, we can do a lot of really cool stuff. Okay? You don't really have to do the integrals. Cauchy did all of them. Okay? So you just have to use the formula. Okay. So that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And we're going to try to find uh, some constraints in the possible correlator. So I'm going to define the OBEs that you saw already. With Robert. We're going to try to define the OBEs using this trick. 
then I'm gonna tell you how the two point functions of conformal field theories are totally solved. And if I'm lucky, I'll tell you how the stress tensor transforms and then teach you how to do it. And that, which actually I will not Okay, see you.